Good morning and welcome to St. Francis of Assisi Episcopal Church here in Utwa, Tennessee. We are delighted that you are here with us in person and we are delighted you are joining us virtually whether in real time or later. Your prayers and your presence enrich our worship life. And we want to be sure you can worship along with us if you go to our website, sfaec.org, and download our full text bulletin. In it, you'll find all the hymns we're singing, all the scripture readings, as well as all the prayers. And we begin this morning with our opening hymn, Blessed Jesus at Thy Word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Thank you.
almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice hear you mountains the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth for the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel oh my people what have I done to you and what have I wearied you answer me for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 15, beginning on page 6. We will read it in unison. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill, whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right, who speaks the truth from his heart. There is no guile upon his tongue. He does no evil to his friend. He does not keep contempt upon his neighbor. In his sight the wicked is rejected, but he admires those who fear the Lord. He has sworn to do no wrong, and does not take back his word. He does not give his money in hope of gain, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall never be overthrown. A reading from the first le- from a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, "I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart." Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, 
God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is love, what God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is a source of your life in Christ, Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that it is it as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. and for 
proceeded to get into the pulpit dressed as, you guessed it, a bee. As it was, a bee in the pulpit. We were all so struck by the absurdity of this story and laughing so hard that no one thought to ask if they meant the priest was just donning some of those like cute, bobbly antenna, or if this was like the full get up, like wings and a stinger, like, you know, who, who knows? And as I started to work on this sermon later that day, I found myself still laughing perhaps a little too loudly for the library. <laughs> Imagine what the liturgical implications of such a stunt would look like. Like, can you imagine like, watching a priest like trying to put a chasuble like, over all of that and like making sure it's like, covering their stinger and, you know? I mean, it's absurd, right? My next thought, though, was weightier, less jovial. Why the extra measures and maneuvers? Why the catchphrases and the gimmicks, really? As comforting as the words are when read from the page, do the Beatitudes actually make us uncomfortable in our contemporary context? Could any of what was being described in these stories be ways for those priests, knowingly or unknowingly, to distract from their own discomfort with the text? Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. Are we, any given Episcopalian, sitting in any given pew, in any given church, any of these things? In reading Gary's commentaries to see how other theologians might provide answers to my questions, the Beatitudes were described as being everything from a Christological statement that emphasizes Christ's primacy among the prophets. Because how in our gospel he was seen physically higher than others, how the disciples came to him, how his speech was like a decree, that Jesus was sort of like in this kingly posturing. All the way to the quote unquote eschatological entrance requirements for those who wish to participate in the eternal kingdom of God. If what I was reading was right, and these are Christ's so-called entrance requirements, what are the implications for who may and who may not abide upon God's holy hill? How many Episcopalians might not get in? It seemed all so short-sighted. And this leads me to the story I shared among seminarians. During the pandemic, as I was going through the formal discernment process with the Diocese of Georgia, my rector asked if I would lead morning prayer over Zoom on Fridays. He thought it would be a good practice for me, especially considering that in place of the Saints of the Second Canticle, I was expecting to have a five-minute homily prepared each week. One homily I gave spoke to the condition of the widow who deposited her last two copper coins into the temple treasury, a parable also known as the widow's offering or the widow's might, which can be found in both Mark and Luke's gospel. In my homily, I tied the gospel lesson into my favorite intercessory prayer for suffrages A. Yes, I have a favorite one. I am putting my church aid on full display. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. I explained to those virtually gathered that every time I read this versicle in its response, I feel a swift tug on my heart, because it reminds me of a time when I was in need and on the receiving end of a feeding ministry. It reminds me of the hope I clung to for God to work in and through my life, to improve my circumstances, and just how far God has lifted me up from the shame I felt entering that darkened, inhospitable church basement where the food pantry was housed, to now finding my life's joy in answering God's call into ministry. The next Monday at morning prayer, a parishioner who had taken part the previous Friday asked one of our assisting priests 
priest that the suffrage I highlighted was specifically referencing poverty. I sensed by the way she asked that I had struck a nerve. The assisting priest, possibly sensing the same, answered, no, the way I see it, when the Bible talks about the poor, like in the Beatitudes, it's talking about the poor in spirit. And isn't that every one of us? Aren't we all in need of God's grace? I didn't have the heart or the theology to argue with him then, but I can tell you, after his comments, I felt like part of my story, part of my witness to that same grace, had been diminished by his words. Was this priest, in his relatively wealthy, comfortable station in life, uncomfortable with the prospect that God could have a preference for the poor? Was that what had gotten under the skin of the parishioner, too? Can it be possible, can we say, that God cares for one person more than another? If we say that, does that or doesn't that mean those with more privilege are somehow getting left out of God's salvific plan? That they need to find some workaround to equate their suffering with the suffering of others? Was that why Christ gave us the Beatitudes? To equate suffering? That's what I felt the priest was doing. And like in the commentaries, it didn't feel right either. Ada Maria Sassi Diaz, <coughs> another contemporary Latina Mucarista theologian, offers us this. Solidarity with the oppressed and among the oppressed has to be at the heart of Christian behavior. Because the oppression suffered by the majority affects everyone. This solidarity demands a preferential option for the poor. This preferential option is not based on the moral superiority of the poor. It does not mean that personally those who are oppressed are better or more innocent or purer in their motivations. The preferential option is based on the fact that the point of view of the oppressed, pierced by suffering and attracted by hope, allows them in their struggles to conceive another reality. Because the poor suffer the weight of alienation, they can conceive a different project of hope and provide dynamism to a new way of organizing human life, our earthly life, for all. Solidarity, as defined by Isosceles, is not equating our experience with another's experience but is instead defined as those actions that lead to the recognition and valuing of differences, as well as to the need to determine how to deal with differences and the grounds for determining who experiences privilege at any given moment. Because ultimately, theology is about the liberation of all. Explained in another way by another seminary in our discussion. Understanding God's love and preferential care for the poor as we see it Beatitudes, or for any marginalized group, is like when their two children, one much older and stronger than the other, fight. Do they love both of their children? Yes, of course. Do they show a preference toward protecting the younger child? Yes, of course. They must show that care in order that the child might not, to use another colloquialism, get the snot beat out of them. And as I was preparing this sermon, and like reflecting on her words, and as I stand in this pulpit and reflect on her words, I think of Tyree Nichols, the young black man who was most recently fatally beaten by the Memphis police force. And I think about how much more desperate our human condition is than my friend's example. I think about how so many of us, so many that society push aside, need God's care and protection. And this, this I think is what the Beatitudes are orienting our minds and hearts towards. As followers of Christ, we are challenged to make a preferential option for the poor, namely to create conditions 
for marginalized voices to be heard, to defend the defenseless, and to assess our own lifestyles in addition to assessing the policies and social institutions in terms of their impact on the poor, on the meek, on the mournful, on those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This option does not mean pitting one group against another. It does not mean a false spiritual equating of our privilege and circumstances to another, but rather the Beatitudes call us to strengthen the whole community. This lesson that Christ gives us is so very big and so very important. It is admittedly daunting and unquestionably uncomfortable for many. But it is what we as Christians are called to do. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God who cares especially for the poor, yet loves all of us. Amen. Please stand. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 11. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. prayers of intercession. Formed by the word and promise of God, let us pray that the merciful glory of God manifest in all the earth may drive away all darkness and that God's providence lead all people from death into life, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the church of Christ, that knowing now only in part, it may wait until in humility and joy to see your full light. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For preachers, that they may speak clearly of your Christ, transfiguring the words of ancient prophets. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the sick, for the dying, and for all who have asked for our prayers, including those on our short-term list. Pat Allen, Bob Andrews, Clarissa Boyer, Michael Bradley, Mary Burgett, Mary Drake, Asa Gannon, Nellie Groberg, Charles Hall, Robert Hawks, Ben Heap, Mary and George Hester, Stanley Horning, Darren Lee, Greg Love, The Love Family, Gladys Martin, Allison McCants, Banks McMay, Christine Nichols, Nevea Roberts, Randy Rockhold, Nancy Rose, Dina Roth, Andrea Simulus, Jody Slowinski, Jerry Smith, the Vogel family, Mike Wilson, Lena 
Woodson, Ann, Ashley, Christine and family, JG, Lisa, and Magnolia, that you will cause light to shine out of their darkness. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the earth and for their leaders, that they may learn the ways of your peace. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who seek you, not knowing your name, that they will find that your everlasting mercy has enlightened them and called them by name. Lord, in your mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Brian, our bishop, for St. James of Knoxville and our diocese, and for all angels of Spearfish in our companion diocese of South Dakota, and for the Chattanooga Food Bank. Lord, in your mercy. For those celebrating birthdays this week, including Arlene Callagher, Gordon Moore, Jeff Persley, Daniel Zelensky, for those celebrating anniversary, and for those on our parish family prayer cycle, Gerald and Lola Sniff, Nancy Sosha, Suze and David Southern, Lord, in your mercy. For those who have died, including the Reverend Carl Crump, Kay Marie Kendall, Bernice Love, Stu Vogel, Lord, in your mercy. Before you, O oh God, are all our prayers and all our needs. You are our life and light, our mercy and hope, and our ever dawning day. Hear us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'm going to keep our senior, uh, former senior warden up here because he and our former junior warden are going to present the new members of the vestry and commission our vestry for 2023. And I invite all our vestry members of 2023 to come up. And thank you for who, those of you who came back from an earlier service to do this. We have to pull the, one of our sound technicians up. All right, Cindy and Darius, if you all will stand close to the mic over there so that everybody can hear us. And y'all are just gonna speak loudly because we are mic'd up here. If you look up there, there is a mic. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body and given gifts for a variety of ministries for the common good. Our purpose is to commission these persons in the name of God and of this congregation to a special ministry to which they are called. This is addressed to Sandy and Darius. Are these persons you are to present prepared by a commitment to Christ as Lord, by regular attendance at worship, by the knowledge of their duties to exercise their ministry to the honor of God and the well-being of his church. I believe, I believe they are. You have been called to a ministry in this congregation. Will you, as long as you are engaged in this work, perform it with diligence? I will. will you faithfully and reverently execute the duties of your ministry to the honor of God and the benefit of the members of this congregation? I will. To all of you, I present to you these persons to be admitted to the ministry of Warden, and that would be Dexter and Larry. Oh, he's over there. <laughs> They are our senior and junior warden, and then all our other vestry members, Annie and Sheila, Lynn, Ed, Mary, Becky, and um, the Hudsons who are not with us right now. The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. I am your servant, grant me understanding. That I may know your decrees. Let us pray. Eternal God, the foundation of all wisdom and the source of all courage, enlighten with your grace the wardens and vestry of this congregation, and so rule their minds and guide their counsels 
that in all things they may seek your glory and promote the mission of your church through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of God and of this congregation, I commission each of you as, warden, as members of the vestry and Dexter and Larry as wardens of St. Francis of Assisi Episcopal Church. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you all. And as they go back, the peace of God be always with you. And also with you. God's peace. everybody to be comfortable. Um, we at St. Francis try to make communion as accessible as possible. This is the Lord's table. All are welcome at it. And we want you to feel free to come up and receive communion. And so we have it in several different ways. We have what we call the mini chalice, which contains a small wafer of bread at the top and you just peel back the foil and have that wafer and then you can turn it over and peel back the foil and there's a thimble full of wine in there. It's one way to take it. That our deacon Josh Weaver will be holding on a tray for you to come forward. I will have a patent with wafers of bread on it that you may receive. If you would like your wafer dipped, what we call in tinted, in the wine, I will be happy to do that. I'll have a small chalice to do that with on my patent. And then Shelly, our, our seminarian, will also have a full chalice, the common cup as we call it. So if you prefer to take communion from the common cup, you're most welcome to do that. Just let us know as you come forward your preference and we, because we want all welcome. And if none of those appeal, please still come forward and have a prayer with us. This is the Lord table and all, and we do mean all, are invited to this table. Now, I invite you to turn back to the psalm we had this morning, Psalm, 1, <coughs> psalm 15, and here again, verse one. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide on your holy hill?
All things come of you, O Lord. We continue on page 14. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Because of the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world, and him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming and glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ. And bring us to that heavenly country where with blessed Francis and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
post-communion prayer is found in the middle of page 18. Let us pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in this sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. First of all, a heartfelt thank you from the Love family and from all of us here to the many who worked so hard yesterday to make that funeral as we celebrated Bernice's life and entrusted her to God's eternal care, a truly special one. The family was deeply grateful and expressed their thanks over and over again and wanted to be sure I shared it with all of you. So thank you to the many who made the wonderful reception possible and the, the special worship together possible. We are grateful. And speaking of receptions, thanks to the Moor, we not only get to break bread around this table, but if you'll walk down the hall as we, as we leave this space, there is a wonderful spread of food down the hall. I, I believe you will find a, a, something for everybody. So please wander down the hall. Let us spend that time getting to know each other better and sharing uh, some more stories, uh, maybe even a colloquialism or two that we find particularly special, but we invite you all to do that. Um, this is another busy week here. I bid your prayers as we prepare for diocesan convention. Our diocese will convene in Johnson City this Friday, and they'll also be up there Saturday. Um, amongst those going are Darius Bagley and the Hartmans from this service, of course, our clergy, Josh Weaver, and uh, Lynn Armstrong, who was in and then left, our, one of our new vestry members. They'll all be going to diocesan convention to represent us. So I bid your prayers as they get ready. Monday, we have yoga. Monday night, Tuesday, we have music lessons in the parish hall all afternoon to about 7 p.m. Wednesday, we are here to pack sack packs in the kitchen for the children, school children around us, doing 77 sack packs each week for children. They go to Udawai Elementary School children and Snow Hill Elementary School children for those who might do without food over the weekend. Following that at 6, we worship together in person and online. And at 6.15, we're going to continue our study of the books of the Bible named for women. This time, we're going to start Esther chapters 1 and 2. Not too late to join us. Come join us. And if being there in person is it workable, let us know and we can Zoom you in. Just let us know. Thursday, Tai Chi goes on, as I said, Friday and Saturday, Diocesan Convention in Johnson City. Sunday, we'll be back here for 8 and 10 o'clock. Sunday School for Children and Youth at 9 and at 5 p.m., a very special offering it will be a candlelight concert for Candlemas, the celebration of when Jesus was presented in the temple. And by candlelight, we will do a small worship service and hear an incredible concert from Harv Wildman's Anglican Choir. So please plan on joining us. There will even be food afterwards. We would love to see all of you be present for that. Now, as always, I need the children up here to help me for the final blessing. Y'all can come up on the... It's called a chancel. Hands up. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Our closing hymns.